Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our Tuesday lunchtime talk today on e-beam lithography. If you have any questions during the talk, feel free to put it in the chat. I see that we have one first from uh, Lucas, I'll mention. We are recording this and we can make that available to you rather than having individuals record it. If, uh, like I say, if you have any questions, go ahead and put them in the chat and we'll try to cover as many as we can at the end of the talk. And today's uh, talk is being brought to you by Dr. Edmund Chow. He has 22 years plus of experience with electron beam lithography in academic institutions, government labs, and industrial research laboratories. He came to Holignac Micro and Nanotechnology Lab in 2006. And prior to that, he's worked at places including Agilent and Sandia National Labs. We're pleased to uh, bring this talk to you today. My name is Mark McCollum, and if you have any questions, you can email me or Edmund, and otherwise, we're going to get started. Um, thank you, Mark, for the introduction, and um, thank you, uh, everyone, for attending our first webinar. Um, today, uh, we are going to talk about how to use contrast curve in e-beam lithography pulses. However, those techniques that we are going to talk about can also be applied for on um, in, in optical lithography, especially those direct right optical lithography, such as using Heidelberg system. So um, I will first give you guys a one slide introduction on how e-beam lithography work. And then I will show you how to measure a contrast curve for a EBL process. And finally, I will share with you uh, some application uh, using EBL process as an examples. So how does e-beam lithography work? Um, shown here is a uh, electron beam scanner, which is basically act like a capacitor, allow you to deflect the beam into different places on your sample. So shown here is your sample. The sample is coated with electron sensitive chemical known as e-beam resist. Um, the scanner is controlled by the computer, which in turn controlled by the user by using the CAT computer aided design file. Basically the CAT file will tell the scanner where to expose, uh, which pixel to expose and with how much charge. Um, in a, um, mo most of the current e-beam, uh, most of the current e-beam system are typically using a set beam current set by the user within one exposure. Obviously in different exposure, um, you can choose different beam current um, for different feature size. But in one single exposure, typically we use one beam current because if you change the beam current during uh, one exposure, it will take time to stabilize and change uh, and require to change the focus and other parameters. And because of that, um, most of the time we will fix the, we will use a uh, set beam current uh, in one exposure. Um, but the scanner can apply different dose based on your CAT file by changing the dwell time. Um, the dwell time is basically how much time the beam stay at each pixel. The dwell time has a very simple relationship between the um, dose that you want to apply to the pixel and the beam current and the pixel area. Basically the dwell time is equal to um, the dose times the pixel area, which will be equal to the charge and divided by the beam current, it will be the time. You can do the dimension analysis very easily. So um, that is one advantage with um, uh, scanning e-beam lithography because you can apply different dose in a single exposure. Um, unlike in the uh, imaging optical lithography, typically in one single exposure, you can only have one 
uh, one dose uh, determined by your exposure time. But because it's a scanning lithography system, it allows you to deliver different dose at different pixel within a single exposure by changing the dwell time. So um, in this particular example, I'm going to say we only need to expose two pixels. Uh, so there will be only two pixels in this exposure, one here and uh, one here. And we want to deliver uh, 100 microcoulomb here per centimeter square. And let's say for the um, uh, uh, beam current and the pixel area, let's say uh, the dwell time is 10 microsecond. So a typical, that is a typical order of magnitude, the dwell time that uh, in most of the e-beam system with a typical current and typical sensitivity of the resist. So if this is 10 microsecond, then if you want to deliver 50 microcoulomb per centimeter square, you just cut the dwell time by half, which is five microsecond. Upon exposure, um, you, what happened to the uh, resist? So shown here is the chemical structure of a very classic E-beam resist known as PMMA. Um, it's a long chain of polymer. I think most of you, uh, at least some of you must have used PMMA before or at least hear about it. So upon exposure, this long polymer chain, PMMA, will have depolymerization. So the EBM will cut those long polymer into shorter pieces and become PMMA fragments, which in turn will increase the solubility of those exposed to PMMA during the development process. So for example, uh, for the 100 microcoulomb uh, uh, per centimeter uh, dose in this pixel, uh, let's say we have enough depolymerization and the solubility after exposure is high enough such that um, um, after develop, all the resists get removed, get developed away. Uh, for the 50 microcoulomb, we have a partial depolymerization. The solubility of the PMMA in that pixel is higher than the unexposed, unexposed area. However, it's not quite high enough uh, to clear all the resists. So it's this simple uh, process allow us to measure the contrast curve in one single exposure. And uh, here's, here is how we do it. Shown here um, is a um, microscope picture on a resist uh, known as SAP 520A and the thickness is 540 nanometer. We develop in CDN50 for two minutes. And in this exposure, I expose uh, 17 rectangle. And the size of the rectangle is 20 micron by 40 micron, as you can see from this scale bar here. Each number corresponds to the dose that we specify in the CAT file, how much uh, dose we want to uh, expose in each rectangle from 10 microcoulomb all the way to 150 microcoulomb. And you can see that for 10 microcoulomb, we barely, we barely see any feature, which is because the dose is so low, none of the set resists get dissolved away during our development. But as we increase the dose, you can see uh, the partial set removal and eventually around 110 microcoulomb, you can kind of see is completely clear. But to know how much resist get removed, we need to measure it. Uh, we measure it with a, uh, a, a stylus profiler and the stylus tip we have is five micron. And that's the reason I choose to uh, make our rectangle 20 micron by 40 micron because this is big enough uh, uh, for the five micron stylus tip to measure it. If we make it smaller, we will require to use the AFM, which will take longer time. For a uh, stylus profiler, you only take five minutes, less than five minutes to scan across all uh, uh, 17 of the rectangle. As we scan across it in this row, you can see that the corresponding step height continue to increase and eventually saturate around 500 some uh, nanometer. 
So if we plot the step height, step height as a function of dose, the dose is in log scale. You can see at 10 microcoulomb, we, we have basically zero step height, meaning that none of the VCs uh, get removed during the development process. As we increase the dose, you can see the step height continue to increase and eventually uh, saturate at 540 nanometer, which is the same as uh, what we have before, uh, before our exposure. So meaning that uh, at those dose, all the sap has been developed away. The detailed parameter of the uh, uh, process is shown here. Um, I have to emphasize that a contrast curve is not only a property of the VCs. It actually depends on the substrate. It depends on the uh, exposed uh, accelerating voltage. Obviously, it depends on the developer and the development time and development temperature. So basically, it, it is a characteristic of the process, entire process. So um, we will go through that uh, in the later part of my talk. Um, so um, after we get the raw data, um, we will do a curve fitting. And here is the fitting function. Um, you don't need to know the detail of this uh, 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 formula, um, but doing a curve fitting allow us to get a consistent, well-defined uh, 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 critical dose. So the critical dose we define here is um, we want to find the dose at 50% of the resist gap we move away. So for 540 nanometer resist, we'll come down here and find 270 nanometer and find the dose. The critical dose in this particular process is 73 microcoulomb. The lower the critical dose, it means the resist is more sensitive, meaning that it requires less electron to clear the dose. Um, so in general, we would like to have a sensitive resist uh, because it will, um, the exposure, ta exposure time will be less and we can do it faster. Um, and 73 microcoulomb per centimeter square is a very, far, uh, very fast resist or very ex uh, sensitive resist uh, in, in terms of E-beam lithography. Um, another important parameter of a contrast curve uh, is the contrast gamma. Gamma is proportional to the slope. Uh, the mathematical definition uh, of a gamma is shown here, but we won't go into detail. Basically, uh, it, it, it is, uh, the sharper the slope, uh, the higher the contrast. In an ideal binary lithography system, um, the contrast curve is going to be a step function. So below the critical dose, nothing gets developed away. After the critical dose, everything goes away. And then the gamma will be infinity. But obviously in a practical uh, process, we won't see uh, uh, an infinite uh, contrast. Um, so there are some situations that, uh, some application that require low contrast resist such as grayscale lithography, but we won't talk about that. So in general, our contrast directly related to the resolution and the higher the contrast, uh, the better the resolution. Now, um, why do we care about the D50, the critical dose and the contrast? Um, one reason we care about is by measuring the contrast curve, it allow us to migrate our EBL process across different EBL system. And one reason I choose to talk about this uh, because uh, I feel this is the right moment because at U of I, both HMNTL and MRL are going to upgrade our EBL system. At HMNTL, um, the system will be upgraded from 50 kV to 150 kV. At MRL, I was told it will be upgraded from 30 kV to 100 kV. As I said before, the contrast curve depends on accelerating voltage. 
uh, the critical dose is going to change. Why is that? Why do we expect the accelerating voltage will change our critical dose? To explain that, I'm going to show you a uh, Monte Carlo simulation done with the Beamer software on a 500 nanometer PMMA on silicon structure for four different accelerating voltage. The orange color represent the PMMA, the purple color represent the silicon structure. The color scale here, you can't quite see it because the Beamer software just make it so small. Um, but basically, uh, red color means higher, high energy, high electron energy density. Blue color means low energy, uh, lower electron uh, energy density. On the first look, you can see uh, all four of them have basically the same electron energy distribution. If that's the case, why do we expect the critical dose of the conscious curve to change when we change the accelerating voltage? The reason that we expect it to change is because it looks the same, but it actually is an illusion. If you look at the length scale, for 30 kV, this length scale corresponds to one micron. For a similar length scale in the 150 kV case, it's actually 20 micron. That means this distribution is compressed by 20 times. If you actually pay more attention, you can already see it without looking at the scale bar because the PMM layer thickness is the same across all four kV. So that can be our scale bar. You can see that at 30 kV, uh, you can see the PMM layer, PMMA layer. But at 150 kV, because the scale get compressed by 20 times, you barely see that orange layer. So what does that mean? It means that at high kV, most of the electron actually penetrate directly through the resist without any interaction. That means even you put the same dose, meaning that you put the same amount of charge, only in the high KV situation, there will be much less percentage of the electron has a chance to interact with the resist because the energy is so high, the electron just penetrate right deep into the structure without interacting the resist. And it end up making the same resist become a lot less sensitive in a high KV system. And you may wonder why we spend millions of dollars to upgrade a E-beam system uh, to make the E-beam resist less sensitive. That is an interesting question, but uh, that's not the main topic. But if we have time, we, we, we can talk about it. For now, what we want to focus on is we know the resist sensitivity is going to decrease as we increase the accelerating voltage, but by how much? So using the contrast curve because of this tra sharp transition and the curve fitting, we have a consistent, well-defined critical dose. Using the contrast curve, uh, measure, the contrast, uh, measure the critical dose in our existing EBL system at a lower KV now, then we get one critical dose. Once we get the new E-beam system, we can do the same dose matrix, get the new critical dose under a higher accelerating voltage. And if we take the ratio of the new critical dose to the original critical dose that we measure in our old E-beam system, we can get a dose correction factor. That will allow us to apply that dose correction factor to all the pulses, EBL pulses, that we develop in the old E-beam lithography system and easily apply it to the new EBL uh, system. And that avoids us to start uh, develop new pulses for the EBL uh, system when we upgrade to uh, 100 kV or 150 kV. So essentially, by characterize your pulses with a conscious curve, allow you to make the EBL pulses more portable. Not only allow in this situation when we upgrade the EBL system, 
For example, we know that in a year, both MNT, HMNTL and MRL will have a very good EBL system. But sometimes we have to do maintenance on those systems, we have to do repair. If we know the contrast curve in all in both systems, that will much that will allow us to use the other system as a backup much easier. Because you don't need to do a dose test, you can fairly easy to to move your process one from one system to another system. Looking ahead even more, all of you is going to uh, graduate. Um, and after you graduate, you may continue to do EBL. You may even continue to pattern the same uh, similar feature. In that case, if you get your dose curve for your current EBL system, and when you move to a new institute or new uh, company that you, you need to do eBL for the similar process, you don't need to develop the process from scratch again. You can apply the same dose correction factor. So those are, uh, uh, those are the reason that why I feel conscious curve is a good parameter to make the eBL process more portable and, and and save you uh, time to, to, to start a new process from scratch. Another reason that I, um, I suggest you to measure the contrast curve is because it allows you to monitor the health of the EBL resist. Um, some of you may know that EBL resist is actually very expensive. For example, the sap 520 a the one that I show you the contrast curve in the first few slide, cost almost $3,000 for just 100 milliliter. And the manufacturer recommends shelf life is only 12 months, even stored in the refrigerator at 4 degrees C. Another expensive EBIM resist is known as HSQ, which is a negative resist. Uh, and it costs about $1,500 for, uh, for 125 milliliter. And the manufacturer shelf life is even shorter, uh, half a year, even stored in the freezer at minus 20 degree. So what I suggest you to do is when you get your new resist, when, when the new resist ship to you, measure the contrast curve, get the baseline, find out what the critical dose when the resist is completely fresh, find out what the gamma is. And then you can monitor the contrast curve um, every two months or every three months or even every six months. By doing that, you know whether your resist has deteriorated due to aging or not. Um, I have seen that especially for SAP, the critical dose and gamma doesn't change after 12 months. It actually remains the same. So if that's the case, uh, it will be a shame to throw away the resist simply, simply because the manufacturer is saying it's 12 months. But if you don't measure the contrast curve, you have little way to know whether the resist has de degraded or not. So by doing this exercise right at the beginning and doing it in a regular way, regular, regular interval, you build up the confidence that your resists uh, are, are, are still working. And even if the resist does deteriorate or degrade or change the somewhat, if the gamma remain the same, only the critical dose get increased or decreased, you can still use those resists because you can apply a dose correction factor. If the gamma is still remain roughly the same, most likely uh, the resolution will still, about, will still be about the same and you will still be able to use those degraded resists to resolve the feature that you want to resolve. So by doing this dose correction factor, you actually can still use those resists, even though uh, it has changed somewhat. But if you know what your uh, critical dose is, dose is, you can still use it. So that will save you a lot of uh, uh, time and money. Why do I say time? Time because if you 
wait until your exposure fail and 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 and, and then you try to figure it out then then that is a lot of waste of time but if you uh keep regular monitoring the health of the disease you apply the dose correction factor uh it, it will um it will save you time because you you know confidently that uh instead of wasting some uh, variable sample um those tests those uh those contrast curve can be measured on silicon so allow you to do all this in a much uh, uh reliable way and even if you are willing to spend the money purchase new resist it still will command you to measure the contrast curve because from one batch of resist to the next batch of the resist there's no guarantee the critical dose is still remain the same by doing this simple measurement allow you to be confident that the new resist you get is still same as the one you used before in addition um, as i said before the contrast curve can also depends on the substrate material shown here is a contrast curve uh, step height versus dose measured on the same thickness of the sap around 540 nanometer of sap on two different substrate the red curve correspond to the lithium nile based substrate and the black curve correspond to the silicon substrate um, by doing the curve fitting, you can see that um, the critical dose, uh, the D50 for the lithium nile bay, is slightly higher than the silicon. It's about 7% higher. So um, by, by doing the dose curve once on lithium nile bay, once you know um, you have to increase the dose compared to silicon by 7%. You can potentially doing those, uh, doing the dose test or dose calibration uh, on silicon and apply it to lithium now bay. I mean, lithium now bay may not be uh, uh, very expensive, but if you have some very expensive material like gallium phosphide or, or, or some material that you only have limited supply and you cannot afford to do a lot of those tests on you can potentially uh, use silicon to do those tests and just do it once to measure the contrast uh, the critical dose for two different material so you can use the more widely available uh, material to do those tests and apply it to the limited uh, applied it to the actual material that uh, you actually need to pattern. Obviously, it's always better to do the dose test on the exact same material. But if there are situations that you don't have that, you don't have enough material to do dose calibration, that is a um, another way to do it. Um, another uh, dependence on the Another dependence on the conscious curve and the critical dose can affect the critical dose is the resist thickness. Um, shown here is again the conscious curve, step height versus uh, dose. This time both exposed it on silicon structure, but one is with uh, 540 nanometer sap resist. The other one is for 400 nanometer sap resist. And you can see that uh, the curve pretty much follows the same, but the critical dose is actually lower because we define the critical dose as 50% of the resist gap we move. So for 400 nanometer resist, it means 200 nanometer resist left. And uh, you can see that um, the 400 nanometer uh, uh, sap has a slightly lower uh, critical dose than the 500 40 nanometer. And that is kind of expected because uh, you have thicker resist, you probably need uh, slightly more charge to, 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 uh, to, to clear it in the same amount of development time. But it's only 4% uh, lower, which means that uh, uh, it's still a good information. It means that when you need to use different thickness of the resist, you probably don't need to do a separate dose test. You can use the same dose that uh, for, for, for uh, most of the uh, resist thickness, at least uh, uh, for SAP uh, cases. So 
um, finally, I want to show you uh, the dependence of um, contrast curve, how it changed with the development time. Shown here is the optical microscope image. Um, again, the resist is five, uh, 540 nanometer sub. The derapper is the same for all six of them. And uh, the only thing changed is the derailment time. And I expose the same dose matrix, 17 rectangle, range from 10 microcoulomb all the way to um, 115 microcoulomb. And you can see that as the derailment time increase, the dose required to clear the resist uh, decrease. Even without doing any alpha stepper or stylus measurement, you can see that uh, for half minute, uh, it takes 150 microcoulomb to clear it, and then it continues to decrease uh, down to 100 microcoulomb per centimeter square. So, what I try to say here is without doing any measurement, any uh, sty uh, alpha stepper or performometer measurement, by doing a microscope. Uh, imaging quick check, you can use this one as an incisional development monitor. What do I mean by that? What I mean is if you expose the same dose matrix consistently together with your actual device, if you do it a few times, you'll gain enough experience in the sense that if your device come out uh, develop well, and if you see that the dose matrix supposed to look like this, then you can build up the confidence. When you see the dose matrix look like this, it means your feature has been clear. The reason that this is useful is because most of the e beam pattern is very small. You can't tell whether the resist in your feature is clear or not by just looking at the optical microscope. However, if you expose the dose matrix on the same sample together with your actual device, you can use it as a uh, 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 in situ development monitor, similar to uh, the color chart that we use in the oxidation uh, 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 process. So some of you know that when we do thermal oxidation, due to the interference pattern, different thickness of the oxide will show up as different color. So people can compare uh, the oxidized silicon wafer with a color chart, and then they know roughly uh, what the thickness of the oxide is. So we are doing exactly the same thing. Um, if we know that after a few times, we know for the process to work after the development, the dose matrix, since we expose always from 10 microcoulomb to 150 microcoulomb, it should look like this. If after development, uh, you see that uh, this, this one show up, uh, the center part show up smaller, you can see this one has a bigger dip, this one has a smaller. If you see after development, instead of seeing what you expect, you see something smaller, you can compensate for it by increasing the exposure time by 15 seconds or so. Um, so that, that, I mean, the, the change could be due to either um, your developer is aging or, or some temperature, room temperature change. And there are many parameters that can change your development. So by doing this, um, you only sacrifice about uh, 400 micron by 200 micron area in your sample. If you can afford that, if you consistently measure it, you can build up uh, uh, an experience to know by looking at those, those matrix, you know whether your feature is exposed or not without even going through measuring the step height. However, if you do measure the step height every time, maybe not every time, but every other time, you get a lot more those those contrast curve that will help you monitor the health of your resist um, without doing anything extra since you already need the exposure and you just require an extra minute to expose that those matrix then you will get a lot of data and um, that's what I did here so I measure the step high 
again, are those curve, uh, step height versus those, uh, for six different developing time. And you can see the orange color half minute definitely has a higher critical dose. And as you increase the development time, that's expected, your, the dose that required to clear the resist will be reduced. So by doing the dose curve fitting, I get the critical dose for all six of them and I plot the critical dose as the function of the development time. Um, and you can see uh, the critical dose uh, start from over 100 microcoulomb, go back down to uh, about 70 uh, microcoulomb per centimeter square. By doing this exercise, we actually allow you to estimate how sensitive is your process relative to the development time. If you try to operate in here, let's say um, you want to do the development for 45 seconds. This is not a very good region because you can see the critical dose change rapidly as you increase the exposure time. That means it's very sensitive. If you hold your sample to develop, targeting develop 45 seconds. If you drop your sample and you end up getting an extra five seconds, you will expect your feature size change a lot because in this region, <clears throat> the critical dose change rapidly with the uh, development time. So a better region will be here. You can see that um, the, the critical dose change much uh, slower relative to your uh, uh, development time. That means if you drop your sample here, your development get an extra 10 seconds or five seconds, it doesn't matter. You, you can see that even you get a half minute difference, the critical dose is only uh, changed by five microcoulomb per centimeter square, which is less than uh, uh, 10%. So most likely you will be okay if you get an extra five seconds. So by doing this exercise, it allow you to see how stable your process is. And you can obviously doing the same thing for temperature and, 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 and other parameter. So that will allow you to know how tight you need to control those parameter in order to get a uh, uh, reproducible uh, 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 process. So in summary, I, I show you that uh, because of the transition, the sharp transition and the math mathematical fitting, the contrast curve allow you um, to uh, have a consistent, well-defined critical dose. And because of that, it allow you to make your EBL process portable across different EBL system. And by doing this contrast curve in a regular time interval, it allow you to monitor the health of the resist and allow you uh, to save time and money uh, uh, in, in, in your EBM exposure. And it also make troubleshooting easier. If your exposure fail, you can either pin down that was the resist or the wrapper problem, or it is not. So it allow you to troubleshoot a, 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 a fail exposure uh, in, 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 a, uh, in a faster manner if you have the baseline pauses. And finally, um, it can provide a dose correction factor uh, for different material, allow you to do those tests in 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 uh, in uh, uh, in different material, and um, if you put the those matrix together with your actual device, it allow you to uh, develop an in situ development monitor. And uh, finally, um, if you do some more study, you can uh, you can determine how forgiving or how tight you need to control your development process uh, uh, in order to get reliable result. Um, with that, I will stop here and uh, we can uh, open for questions. And I think Matt is, has been looking at the chat. chat uh, and, and, uh, but uh, before we go to the question, I want to uh, uh, let you know that we will have another webinar next Tuesday, same time. And I will talk about uh, how to engineer resist profile 
for leaf of application. Uh, you can see that uh, there are different uh, resist profile and uh, some of them are e-beam resist, some of them actually done with photolithography. And I hope you will join us again next Tuesday. And uh, thank you for attending uh, the talk and uh, we can open for questions. Sure, our first question is, what causes the contrast curve to depend on the substrate? Um, that is because of the scattering. Um, they are, um, if you look at the, uh, if you look at um, this, uh, for example, this, uh, this picture here, when we do the simulation, we assume the beam only uh, shining at this origin pixel, only one pixel. And, be, and you can see there's a lot of background dose. So in the ideal case, you want uh, the electron only happen in this pixel. So those are the noise, those are the noise. And depending on, depending on uh, how, uh, how the scattering, uh, the scattering obviously will, uh, will depends on the substrate. If, if we have different scattering, then uh, you are going to get different background. Those are the noise and some have uh, higher noise, some have less and therefore the contrast curve uh, can depends on uh, on the material of the structure because it affects how much electron can get bounced back to your VCs and, and cause those undesired uh, background exposure. Then let me add a follow up. If there's a difference because of the scattering from the substrate, you expect the change that you have from different substrates due to this scattering in your contrast curve, do you expect the difference to change as you change the energy of the beam? Yes. Uh, the, the scattering, uh, you can already see here that um, uh, um, there are a lot more scattering. Uh, so let me show you uh, because because of the scale, you can't really see uh, you can't really see uh, clearly how much scattering you get in in in, in the PMMA four hundred fifty. So let me let me show you uh, uh, the one that we have. Uh, okay, so shown here is the same simulation data. But this time, instead of trying to capture all the electron in all four different KV, I keep the scale bar the same. So you can see the PMMA layer uh, have the same size in all four cases. Um, and you can see that uh, because a higher KV, most the electron is so energetic, the scattering mostly happens deep inside the substrate there will be very less, much less electron bounce back uh, from, from the deep inside the structure back to the resist and cause the undesired exposure. Uh, you can see for 30 kV you have more and uh, 50 kV you have less, uh, 100 kV you even have less and you enter 150 kV you, you have even less. So um, if we plot, if you plot uh, and, and that, is one reason that uh, people are willing to pay a million dollars to increase their accelerating voltage. If you look at, I'm going to show you another slide that show um, at the center. So at 250 nanometer below the uh, resist, I want to show the cross section to see how the electron energy distribution is for all four different KV. So shown here, is the uh, 150 uh, is, is done is coming from the same same simulation, and you can uh, we look at uh, the radial distribution um, from here to here. So this is at the center. This is 10 micron from the center. One thing you can notice is um, for 30 kV compared to 30 kV to 50 kV. So this is 30 kV, the red color. 
the orange color is 50 kV. By increase from 30 kV to 50 kV, the background, the background uh, exposure, the undesirable background exposure reduced by one order of magnitude. And then from 50 kV to 100 kV, it dropped another order of magnitude. And then finally, from 100 kV to 150, it dropped a little bit, probably half order of magnitude. So um, basically, higher kV, one advantage is it reduces the background noise. Those exposure are the noise. You don't want it. And that will give you a better contrast. And that is a much more desirable um, because in the ideal case, let's say you want to expose the grating. The ideal dose distribution should look like this, right? No dose in the opening and uh, full dose uh, where we want to expose. But because of this background, um, your actual dose distribution will look like this. And that will reduce the minimum pitch you can resolve and basically reduce your resolution. So that's why, uh, uh, that's one reason that uh, uh, a, a higher KV system will give you a better resolution. Can and you comment, you used a profiler to get your depths to yes. plot for your contrast curve. Yes. Can you comment on using something other than a line profiler and comment on the value of the resolution of your profiler? And would another technique like AFM uh, help or change your results? Uh, so if you, if you use AFM uh, for a smaller feature, um, so let's say you, you make those features smaller and how small, let's say uh, maybe 100 nanometer, 100 nanometer wide, um, you are going to see the uh, contrast curve shift to the right. Um, as most of you know that um, there is proximity effect. The proximity effect come from the same, uh, same, same, um, same simulation uh, data that I just show you. Because of those background dose, you expose this pixel, you unavoidably expose the neighboring pixel. And obviously, if you have a, and the range, and the range you can see that uh, for 30 kV, the proximity dose drop off about 10 micron to, to negligible. Higher kV will require a longer range, but basically, even you, if, if your feature is big, then the center pixel will receive the background dose from all those neighboring pixel. And, 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 and for 30 kV, that's pretty significant. And that's what the proximity effect is. So if you make those feature, uh, the dose matrix features smaller and using AFM to do it, uh, you are going to see the contrast, uh, the critical dose shift to the right, meaning that it will appear that uh, the, the critical dose is higher. So that's why it's important um, to expose the same size of the feature, because if, you, if, you, if your dose matrix, the first time you do it is 20 micron Y, and the next time you do uh, one micron Y, there will be this geometry effect. Uh, the, the proximity dose effect cause some, uh, uh, you, you cannot compare them. So that's why it's important um, to choose the same uh, dose pattern to do the dose curve. Otherwise you can't compare. If you try to uh, monitor the health of your resist, um, you, you, um, you can expect that the, the, the critical dose is going to change if you change the geometry of your pattern. Uh, but my experience is uh, the if you consistently use 20 micron or you consistently use 100 nanometer, the critical dose, uh, the correction factor, for example, between different development time are roughly the same. 
obviously when you go to the extreme, when you make the feature size 10 nanometer or, or, or at least sharp 100 nanometer, uh, that there may be uh, something uh, not completely scalable. But in general, it's scalable. So what you get, um, you, 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 you can get the correction factor, the same correction factor for, for example, for different resists or different material, um, either you use, it doesn't matter whether you use a one micron size uh, rectangle or 20 micron, uh, the, those correction factor will be roughly the same and therefore you can apply it. You mentioned that the resist doesn't seem to be able to read the date on the bottle. Because of the high cost, and you made comment that if you properly manage your E-beam resist by monitoring the contrast curve in the same way, uh, how long do you expect that HSQ might be able to last compared to its date if you manage it well? And is there a time when it catastrophically becomes unusable? Yes, definitely you, 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 you will see. I think the longest I have used right now is about a year. And, uh, and the, the contrast is going to deteriorate. Um, what I seen in the extra skill is the critical dose will actually start to drop, but the gamma roughly the same uh, after six months. But after a year, uh, the, the gamma will also start to shrink and then you cannot resolve the features. I mean, I mean you can still resolve some uh, uh, bigger pattern, but uh, the, the resolution is going to suffer. In the case of ZEP, do you also expect to get on the order of maybe twice its lifetime if managed well? I, I have seen at least one and a half year. There's actually no change in both the critical, critical dose and the gamma. So definitely ZEP has a longer shelf life. Uh, I, I, I have not seen it after one and a half year that uh, it, it, it changed significantly. So I don't even need to apply the dose correction factor for set. Looks like the slope of the contrast curve gets steeper with a longer development time. Yes. So longer time should give sharper edges and higher resolution. Do you have a plot of the contrast, the gamma versus development time? Um, actually, this um, this uh, this gamma um, actually is slightly smaller as you increase the increase the exposure time, and uh, I I guess it's not obvious uh, not obvious that I don't see an obvious change in, in in the gamma in terms of the development time. Most of the gamma change come from temperature. So let me just show you, um, there are extensive study, extensive study shown here uh, for PMMA and SAP, people have seen, oops, uh, people have seen uh, the, if you want, if you try to improve the gamma, people have seen in both PMMA and SAP resist, the gamma change uh, to much higher, maybe factor of two uh, by using low temperature development. So if you go through those paper, you can see that uh, most people, when they try to improve the gamma, they do it by uh, lower the temperature for both SAP and PMMA. So um, you can, if you go to those paper, you can easily find, and some of the, some of URUC, uh, I think in 2006, uh, also did, a, did some study on PMMA on how to use the low temperature developer. And I have done so as well. It, it, it can improve quite uh, dramatically uh, uh, the, the contrast. And you can kind of expect it that. One reason is um, at high temperature, um, there are thermal pauses. So you cannot distinguish between the 
longer chain of polymer compared to shorter chain of polymer. But as you reduce the temperature, those thermal effect gets suppressed. So it, it, um, even, even though uh, some of the undesirable exposure during, due, due to the proximity effect partially depolymerize some PMMA, but when the temperature is low, those slightly shortening PMMA, the solubility is still very low. So that avoid, that avoid it being removed. So by lowering the temperature, uh, uh, you improve the contrast, but at the expense, uh, the curing dose or the critical dose get increased. Because as you, I mean, this is the high temperature, lower temperature and the lowest temperature. You can see the curve is a lot sharper at low temperature. However, uh, at the expense that the resist become less sensitive, you, it will require you to use higher dose. So if you are trying to improve your gamma, you bet your best bet is to um, use low temperature developer. Can you comment on the direct relationship between the critical dose, sometimes called the clearing dose, and the actual dose needed to completely clear your resist? Uh, yes, yeah, so this is the curve fitting uh, 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 formula. And uh, so the, the, the definition of the gamma is actually called D100, meaning that after the curve fitting, uh, it hit the, uh, all the resist is gone. So it draw a line through the critical dose point, the 50%, with the slope also measured at this point. And, um, and, and so a, you probably can say this is, uh, this is the dose that uh, all the resist expected to, to clear. I mean, it's just, you can see there's no well-defined because at the end it will saturate. So it's really hard to define the, the dose where the resist completely clear because it's not very sensitive. This slope is not very sharp. That's why it's much, uh, it's much easier and well-defined to define at the 50% point because you can define a clear uh, 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 clear point where the uh, resist is completely gone. So um, I, I mean, in, in, the, in, the, in terms of the clearing dose, you, you, you can say here's a clearing dose, but this is just, the slope is so small and it make it not easy to define uh, the clearing dose. And people also define this is called the threshold dose. So where do we see start to um, develop away? Again, because of the slope is so small here, you don't get a well-defined, uh, 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 consistent well-defined uh, threshold dose. Therefore, 50% is a, mathematically well-defined, easy for us to, uh, to compare across different pulses. Very good, thank you, Edmund, and thank you everyone for joining us today. And we hope to uh, see, in quotes, uh, see you next week. Thank you very much.